All right. I spent all my primes on skins for operators I don't have, W took all my LMD, and I don't have enough Arundum to get both Mudrock and Rosemontis. I will never financially recover from this. Now I know Amiya doesn't want me to spend more money at closures, but these are desperate times. Now I should have enough credit left to afford that- Doctor, here you go I got your 6 star supply pack, free of charge, want anything else? Okay closure, I'm gonna need you to max out my third- wait, what did you say? Doctor. No, after that. Want anything else? Before that. I got your six star supply pack, free of charge. Closure, are you feeling alright? Did Calcid threaten you to give away free things again? Thankfully Monster wasn't involved this time. I received your payment for this. What payment? Calcid doesn't let me have cash anymore after I nearly lost a deed to Rhodes Island to Elysium in that poker game. And it's a good thing you had a full house otherwise I'd have lost my shop and have to suck every drop of blood from your body as a down payment for my next entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah, good thing that didn't happen. Otherwise, I'd have no way to pay Warfarin. Anyways, I got your payment from your YouTube channel, Doctor. Your video generated enough revenue to afford you the six-star supply pack as a bonus reward. Well, closure, now you're one step closer to building that Gundam. And that's why I'm making this video. My original plan was to talk about four-star operators before I covered six stars, but that was when I thought Chapter 8 would come out closer to summer instead of, well, now. Since my last Arc Knights video, I've started working for Calcid in order to afford more of Closure's deals. I mean, afford the bills for Rhodes Island. However, a few weeks on the front lines led me to contracting Oripathy, and that took me out for a while, and that's why I didn't make this video sooner. If you're too stupid to read between the lines to figure out what I'm saying, just go back to playing Genshin Impact. But enough about a gotcha that doesn't respect your wallet or you as a person, let's talk about a gotcha that does respect you as a person and your wallet and its premium units, six star characters. A concept that would be utterly ridiculous in any other gotcha, but in Arknights, it surprisingly works incredibly well. Unlike 99% of other gotchas, rarities below the highest level actually mean something in Arknights, as most of the game's content can be cleared with three and four star operators. That said, when you do get to use a full squad of souped up 6 star operators, you really feel their power. The goal of this video is to go over 10 operators who have earned their 6 star rarities and rank them based on how useful I personally feel they are. When ranking these characters, I'm going to cover them at E2 level 50 max trust, as that is the benchmark that most people keep their E2 6 stars at. Don't ask me why, it's just what we do. I'll also mention other points of usefulness as I see fit, such as first and second skills and whatever else extra I think of. With all that out of the way, dear viewer, sit back, kick back, and relax, as I'm going to review the elite among the elite operators of Rhodes Island. Starting off this list, we have a fan favorite operator. Ifrit is an AoE caster with a twist. Instead of having the traditional 3x3 range, Ifrit can only attack four tiles directly in front of her. While this makes Ifrit a much more situational operator, when there is a prime opportunity to use her, Doc does the continent over go wild. Any instance that allows for effective Ifrit use is endearingly referred to as the Ifrit lane. What is an Ifrit lane you ask? An Ifrit lane is pretty much any instance on a map that allows for a defender to create a choke point in which Ifrit can scream at all of her enemies shouting BURN! 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 It's clear to see why many people love this small child, as looking at her stats, you can see that a Max Trust E250 Ifrit has over 900 attack. But if you're rich enough to afford a level 90 pot for Ifrit, her attack becomes a monstrous 1015. Helping Ryan Lab's tragic test subject add more fuel to her flames is her first talent, Spiritual Dissolution, which reduces enemy resistance by 40% at E2. While enemies with some resistance won't feel the full force of quadruple digit damage searing their skin off, her second talent, which unlocks at E2, as is the case for the majority of 6 star operators, just might change that. Rhine Loop restores 2 SP every 6 seconds to Ifrit, essentially giving her a 33% SP boost. This synergizes wonderfully with Ifrit's second skill, Pyroclasm, which triggers when active and at rank 7, costs 8 SP to charge, and Ifrit can hold up to 3 stacks. This skill fires a massive blaze equal to 190% of Ifrit's attack that reduces the defense of all hit targets by a flat 200 for 3 seconds, while also inflicting passive burn damage. 
at M3, the attack's power soars to 250%, the SP charges only 7, and the defense debuff increases to 300. I'll briefly cover her third skill, Scorched Earth, as it turns Ifrit's attacks into an aura, as she turns her attack range into a literal hellscape that deals damage roughly equal to her attack each second, while also cutting enemy resistance by a flat 10 to 20 points, depending on the mastery level. For the 20 seconds that this skill is active though, Ifrit slowly loses HP, but that's really a non-issue if you have good positioning. Due to the skill not hitting aerial enemies and the longer charge time of about 30 SP, Pyroclasm is her preferred skill. Overall, Ifrit is an incredibly fun operator to use. Despite the fact that she passively supports physical damage dealing allies by lowering defense by a flat rate, her unique attack range makes her far more situational than other operators, forcing me to put her lower on this list. Keeping with the trend of situational operators, we have Angelina up next. Angelina is a supporter who has the standard range and slow effect that most supporters have. At launch, Angelina was considered the weakest 6 star in the game, and people were upset about getting her instead of Exusai. Irony aside, that may have something to do with the gimmick involving her second and third skills. These skills utilize her arcane staff, and if you use these skills, Angelina cannot attack unless they are active. While her second skill, Particle Mode, is situationally useful as it allows Angelina to attack multiple times per second, she only gets to use about 40% of her attack depending on mastery level. Anti-Gravity Mode is the real lime-flavored lip balm here. Am I the only one who is confused as hell by the token descriptions in this game? Anyways, Arcane Staff Anti-Gravity Mode has a 25 SP charge and the following effects at rank 7. As I've already said, she cannot attack unless the skill is active, but when it is, it lasts for 18 seconds and reduces any target's weight by one level. As for the effects people actually care about, Angelina's attack gets a 105% boost, she can hit up to 5 targets at the same time, and increases her range from standard supporter range to this unholy abomination. Angelina's skills are why she's so good, and her talents aren't half bad either. Accelerator Field boosts the attack speed of allies, including her own, meaning she can AoE nuke even faster, and her second talent, Arubaito, or part-time job, just heals allies by 25 HP per second when she's not attacking, giving her some actual support capabilities, like her job description says. Contingency Contract 1 is when Ange finally began to shine, as having her was the easy ticket to risk 18, and if you didn't have her, you either banged your head against the wall, or Itut Podenko. At M3, the only real difference for her skills is that M3 gives her third skill a 150% attack buff and a 25 second duration. Angelina and Ifrit are two phenomenal operators, but Ifrit's massive 34 DP cost and Andrew's inconsistent damage are why I put them at the bottom of this list. I love both these operators and think they're incredibly fun and powerful, but the other 8 operators on this list are just more flexible to use and consistently more useful. So, in my 5 star version of this video, I said a somewhat controversial statement that was influenced entirely by my waifu over meta philosophy. Texas is the best offensive vanguard in the game, full stop. Now that I've finally gotten Siege, I can safely say, yeah she's pretty useful, but neither her or Texas are lasting long without Myrtle's talent, and how the fuck did I forget about- Even the comments seem to forget as I saw a grand total of about 3 people mention this Victorian race queen, but let's do her justice now. Backpipe is a 6 star DP on kill vanguard, meaning she restores 1 deployment point for each enemy she fells, and refunds her deployment cost on retreat. Sadly, this type of vanguard only blocks one target, but her first talent, Precise Reloading, gives her a 25% chance to attack a second target in her range for 130% of her attack at E2. This works well with her third skill, Locked Breach Burst, which does the following at rank 7. Bagpipe's attack interval increases, meaning she attacks less frequently, but she can block an extra enemy, her attack and defense increase by 90%, and her attacks hit 3 times while the skill is active, and in the early parts of the map when you'll be using her, most things don't survive that. Now this all sounds nice, but none of what I said is why Bagpipe is a meta-defining unit. Bagpipe's utility comes from her second talent, Martial Tradition. This skill gives all Vanguard operators in the squad plus 6 to their initial SP charge, and at pot 5, 
ups the boost to 8. This skill was so powerful that Bagpipe literally shifted the meta when she released. In high risk CC, when you have to take slow DP or SP charge tags, you rely on the meta trio of Myrtle, Elysium, and Bagpipe to carry you through the initial wave, as Pot 5 Bagpipe puts Myrtle at 1 SP from activating support beta, and Elysium is only 3 SP away from activating support gamma. Keep in mind that Bagpipe's talent works so long as she's in the squad, meaning that you can deploy either of your Sunflower Vanguards in order to gain SP faster, then quickly deploy her in order to activate her skill 3 sooner, allowing you to block extra targets while your Sunflowers gather more SP. Ironically enough, even though Bagpipe is the best offensive Vanguard in the game, it's her utility that makes her such an incredible operator. Next up, we have the newest operator to join Rhodes Island, your PTSD and mine from the Twilight of Womund event, Mudrock. Mudrock is a unique operator, as she is an Enmity Defender, just like Vulcan. However, unlike Vulcan, you will actually use Mudrock for two very big reasons. I am of course referring to her stats and her skills. At E250, Mudrock has almost 800 attack, which is over 300 more than what my max trust level 90 Hoshiguma has. If your next question is why my Hoshiguma is level 90, I know what I'm into, don't judge me. That said, I don't have Mudrock yet at the time of recording this, so I won't get bonked. Mudrock's bonk, also known as her second skill, Crag Splitter, has a 5 SP cost at rank 7, and charges upon getting hit. When ready, Mudrock releases an AoE with a 1 tile radius around her, heals 5% of her max HP, deals 210% of her attack as physical damage, and has a 30% chance to send to Horner Gel, I mean stun for 0.6 seconds. At M3, the skill heals 6% of her max HP, the attack multiplier increases to 270%, and the stun gets double duration. Mudrock's third skill is less used, I think, but I'll still go over it. Bloodline of Desecrated Earth forces Mudrock to idle for 10 seconds, but while she's in this state, she reduces enemy movement in this range around her by 60%. After the 10 seconds pass, Mudrock at rank 7 will stun everything in a 2 tile radius around her for 3.5 seconds, Bonk at the speed of sound gets a 50% defense buff, a 100% attack buff, and now hits all blocked enemies while the skill is active. At M3, the stun lasts for 5 seconds, and the attack and defense buffs go up to 140 and 80% respectively. Hey, you know what they say, there is no skill like overkill. At least I think that's how it goes. Mudrock's talents are also incredibly powerful. Her first talent is a bit weird, but it does give her self-sustainability. On deploy, Mudrock puts up a shield, of which she can stack up to 3 at E2, and she gets a new one every 9 seconds, and is deployed with one active. Each shield blocks one instance of damage, while healing Mudrock for 20% of her max HP when broken. This is Mudrock's primary form of healing, as she can't get healed normally, being an Enmity Defender. Her second talent, Unshakable Solidarity, reduces the damage she takes from Sarkaz enemies by 30%. This is as great as damage mitigation gets, but there's also the fact that the game loves throwing powerful Sarkaz enemies at us, especially in the upcoming CC, and Mudrock will be a great asset in those fights. Overall, Mudrock is a fantastic operator, and just like what I did with Shamir in my 5 star video, I'm kinda underrating her as I don't know how meta defining she will be, as I don't really look at CN stats too much, but I put her over Bagpipe because Mudrock is better in CC than her. On limited deployment maps, if you can only use 10 or 7 or Calcid forbid 4 operators, Mudrock is going to be one of your top picks because she is incredibly stacked as her stats are massive, and they better be as she costs a whopping 36 DP to deploy. Mudrock is a great operator to have, and I look forward to seeing how her usage plays out in the global servers. Now please come to my base and bonk me Miss Mudrock! And with Mudrock out of the way, the remaining operators on this list are the ones that I would personally consider to be S plus tier. The previous four are definitely amazing operators, but these next six are easily the best in the game. First up is our Biwok, that bitch with the chainsaw, who dropped in chapter 6 and has sliced everything in her path since, including me when she hears what I just called her, Blaze. As an AoE guard, Blaze can block up to 3 enemies at E2 and attacks up to the same number of enemies in her range. Her first talent, Emergency Defibrillation, and no that was not my first take, activates once whenever her HP drops below 25% 
and does the following at E2. Blaze will heal 50% of her max HP and have at least 50% of her max HP for 6 seconds after the skill activates, not exactly making her invincible, but is the next best thing. Her second talent, Harsh Training, gives Blaze status resistance 15 seconds after deployment. I'm not even going to explain what that means because I can't think of a single time where that's been useful. What is useful is Blaze's second skill. Chainsaw Extension Mode has the following effects. At rank 7, the skill takes 80 SP to activate, but when active, Blaze gets a 70% attack buff, a 20% defense buff, her range extends by an extra tile, and she gets a 10,000% coolness factor increase for having a skill with the name as fucking metal as Chainsaw Extension Mode. Hey, don't ask me, Makima stands can confirm that they get turned on just from the sound of that name. At M3, the buffs increase to 100% and 35% respectively, and the SP cost is only 70 now. As for her third skill, I don't fucking know what it does. And odds are, most of you watching you have Blaze E2'd probably don't either. I'll put it on screen for posterity's sake, but no one uses it because the consistent damage offered by her second skill is just better. Blaze has a massive 742 attack stat with max trusted E2, so why bother gradually increasing it with her third skill for a single pump when her second skill has a higher damage cap immediately upon activation and is consistent throughout the rest of the map? Blaze, like her beliefs, are simple to follow. You deploy her, you wait about a minute, and then watch as she shreds everything you throw at her. Now Blaze, I know I called you a bitch earlier, but I said it affectionately. I called Spectre the same thing before, and if you kindly- OH GOD YOU NEXTIS PLEASE HELP ME! <sighs> okay. Now that I've put away the big ugly thing- Oh, for crying out loud, that's what the ROBOT IS CALLED! Y you know what? Just get the sexy guitar music ready, okay? We talk about Thorns now. Thorns is a range guard, meaning he has an 80% damage modifier slapped onto his attack. However, I think BP fans will love him as much as I do, as his first talent, Nerve Corrosion, causes him to inflict poison to all targets he hits for 3 seconds, dealing 65 arts damage at E1 and 125 at E2. His second talent, Echoes of Ancestral Waves, heals 3.5% of his max HP per second, but only if he stops attacking and it activates after 2 seconds of being idle. Honestly, it's more useful than you would expect it to be at first glance. Now just like Blaze, only one skill matters on Thorns, but it's his third skill we're looking at, which the localizers boringly called Supreme Arts in game for a while, before finally fixing it to the much cooler sounding Destreza. Destreza is an offensive skill that always requires 15 SP to charge, lasts 30 seconds, and gives Thorns sniper range when active. At rank 7, Thorns gets a 40% attack buff, and his attack speed increases. At M3, the buff is increased to 60%, and his attack speed effectively doubles, letting him attack at ridiculous speeds. This skill is as good as it sounds. Thorns will just fling corrosive sand at lightning speeds at enemies, but what makes the skill useful is its bonus effect. When you activate this Thressa for the second time, the skill becomes permanently active while he's deployed. This means that for long maps, a max trust E250 Thorns can quite easily pump out over 1800 raw DPS, all while having sniper range as a guard. Thorns and Blaze take up these last two spots because they are the brain dead six stars. Once you activate those skills, you can shut your stress brain off and get that easy clear. And honestly, it's kinda nice to do that in this game sometimes. Now there's just one question I have. How did Thorns become the best cosplayer in Rhodes Island? Honestly, all those edits I saw of him are just absolutely hilarious and I want to know what the origin is. It's so good. Some may argue that the last two operators aren't S plus tier material, but there's no denying that the next four operators I talk about are the best four in the game right now. Ranking them honestly comes down to personal preference, and doing so is no easy task for me. So, as I have the list in the description to segment the video, some of you already know that I think Silver Ash is currently the fourth strongest operator in the game. I mean, this idea sounds crazy even to me, as I'm saying Silver Ash is not top 3 in terms of 6 stars, but there's no denying that he's still busted as hell. Going over his skills, first one, garbage. Second one, also garbage. Third skill, oh, now we're talking power. Silver Ash's third skill, True Silver Slash, does the following at rank 7. Silver Ash takes a 70% debuff to his defense, 
Don't worry about that, because his range expands to whatever this is, he can now attack up to 5 targets per swing, and he gets a 160% attack buff. This skill lasts for 26 seconds, but it requires 90 SP to use, however, it starts with 60 on deployment. Now, those numbers are good, but let's talk about the M3. At M3, True Silver Slash gives Silver Ash 75 SP on deployment, his attack increases 200%, and he can now hit up to 6 targets during the 30 seconds in which the skill is active. He still has the defense debuff, but the range is still immaculate. Cow sits and Doc does. What else do I need to say? His talents? Fuck, I don't know what they are. First talent, leader, attack plus 10% and all allies redeployment time reduced by 10%. Okay, that's kinda nice. That plus 70 attack for free is a good bonus. What's the second talent? Eagle Eyes, remove enemy invisibility when they're in his range. Ah, so that's how Silver Ash single-handedly breaks a core mechanic the game uses quite frequently. Hmm, yes, indubitably. Go fetch me more tea so I can offer it to this man with the skill that removes enemy invulnerability while he goes swing swing with his over 1500 attack while hitting up to 6 targets. Okay, Hypergriff, quick question for you: What were you on when making this? Silver Ash can truly do it all thanks to his true Silver Slash. However, he can't continue the bloodline with it and that's why he's not in the top 3. Alright, next segment. Let's not beat around the bush with this one. Next operator, Aya Fiala. If I said her name wrong, you try to do better. Aya skills. Okay, I know some people are apparently so lazy that they unironically M3 Aya's second skill, Ignition, and since I somehow still don't have her even though I've been playing this game for close to a year now, I just question whether these doctors eat paste. Aya's third skill, the Molten Magma on Earth. The super spicy sauce you're too scared to try, but always get when you order Mexican food. The Kilston V Clearer people! Let me talk about Aya Fiala's third skill, Volcano. At rank 7, it does the following. For 15 seconds, Aya's attack increases by 85%, and her attack now becomes an erratic AoE that shoots lava at up to 5 targets in her range. While volcanoing, Aya's attack interval decreases significantly. How significantly, you ask? Uh, this significantly. So, yeah, pretty significantly, I would say. However, if that wasn't good enough, her range goes from traditional caster range to a 3-tile radius around her. At M3, the attack buff reaches 130%, and, just like Silver Ash, she can hit up to 6 targets in her range simultaneously. Aya also has good talents, as her first one is Pyro Breath. Pyro Breath activates when A is deployed, and it gives all casters deployed, including herself, a plus 7% buff to their attack, and the effect is doubled at E2, thus giving Aya even more destructive power. Her second talent, Wildfire, gives Aya a random amount of SP between 7 and 16 upon deployment. I think you understand why I have Silver Ash and Aya Fiala together now. These two operators were infamous for being ridiculously overpowered at the launch of the game. Even to this day, Silver Ash's best competition is Thorns, who only outclasses him if you're going up against constant waves of trash mobs, however, his role is easily replaceable. Aya doesn't really have a similar comparison. Currently, the only other single target caster in the 6-star pool is Kyobi, but Aya's pseudo AoE benefits far exceed anything that this good doggo can do. These two are kind of like Blaze and Thorns in the sense that they are pretty mindless to use, but they do require map and enemy knowledge in order to know when is the best time to proc their busted third skills. As for why Aya is over Silver Ash, it's because of the fact that she can nuke sooner thanks to her second talent, which gives her just a little bit more utility in my eyes, but really, they're both equally as good. Now if only we could get that summer skin for Aya that they teased at the end of the two year anniversary in the CN stream! No wonder she's referred to as the abandoned child. Silver Ash and Aya Fiala are incredibly powerful operators, however, I think the newest guard added at the time of making this video has a powerful third skill that exceeds true Silver Slash and Volcano in terms of power. Surter is an arts guard who is unique not just because she consistently deals arts damage, but because she unlocks both of her talents at E1. 
Her first talent, Molten Flame, ignores 12 enemy resistance at E1 and 20 at E2. Her second talent, Remnant Ash, does the following. At E1, if Surtur takes fatal damage, she becomes invincible but retreats 4 seconds immediately after triggering the ability. This effect is doubled to 8 seconds at E2. We've seen this effect be useful on both Spectre and Blaze, but to understand its importance on Surtur, let me go over her third skill, which is what you will want to M3. At rank 7, Twilight requires 8 SP to activate and has the following effect. Surtur immediately recovers all of her HP, gains an additional 5,000 max HP, has her attack range extend to hit up to 3 tiles in front of her, can now attack up to 3 enemies in her range, and gains a 240% attack buff while the skill is active, and the skill's duration is unlimited. This is the trade-off to all that power. While Twilight is active, Surtur's HP continuously drops, and the amount she loses per second eventually caps out at about 20% of her max HP, but only after the skill has been active for 60 seconds. That was only the skill's effect at rank 7 though. At M3, the effects stay the same, However, there are three significant changes to the skill that make it even better. The first is that the SP cost drops to as little as 5, Surtur's attack gets a 330% buff, and her attack count increases by 3, meaning she can now attack 4 enemies in her range simultaneously. And remember, she deals arts damage while ignoring 20 of the enemy's resistance. Forget your weak ass cherry bomb Chen strats. With Surtur, you are dropping the motherfucking Sar Bomba on your enemies with her. Keep in mind that Twilight has unlimited duration, so if you can keep Surtur alive with enough healing, she can easily out damage both Silverash and Aethiala due to her skill activating way sooner than both of theirs and having a potentially longer duration depending on your team composition. Even if you mess up with Surtur and you trigger her Remnant Ash early, you still get an extra 8 seconds of free DPS before she retreats. Surtur is the strongest offensive operator in the game right now. However, I think there's one other operator who manages to surpass her. Before I go over the number one spot, I would like to take some time to highlight the honorable mentions, but that could be a whole video in and of itself. Every 6 star in this game has great potential, even Mostima. While her archetype is the worst in the game as she's a traditional AoE caster, Mostima can work, it just requires much more effort to do so compared to other operators like Silverash or Aya. So while some of the 6 stars can be considered underwhelming, like with Auk doing his Auk things, I don't think any of them could be considered outright bad, just outclassed or more niche. As for my personal favorites, I have to mention Xu Sai and her apple pie who barely didn't make the list, Hoshiguma was my first 6 star and I don't regret investing so heavily into her, Suzurin is a great supporter who can outperform Angelina in the right situation, Nightingale is going to make me eat my words in the chapter 8 boss fight, W isn't actually that great, but she's my type as a busty Andre, and apparently a lot of CN shares that sentiment with me. And finally, best doggo, CB. Uh, CB? KOB? I hate how localization works. K is an operator who spooked me early on, but I'm so glad this accident came into my base, as I love her so much, especially after she managed to surpass A in the most recent CC, and she became my first 6 star to get an M3. She's the source of my favorite event in Arcanite so far, and she was precious and hilarious in the Unectus event. I mean, just look at her! She's adorable! Oh, who's a good doggo? Who's my precious K9 Gilgamesh? You are! Yes, you are! Yes, you- Uh, right. I have a video to finish. <clears throat> Anyways, let's get on to the number one spot. If it wasn't going to be Surtur who topped the list, it was going to be Saria. Saria was, and still is, the best defender in the game. Hoshiguma may be a better wall, Mudrock may be better at holding down lanes, and Unectus may have the thickest art of all, but none of these defenders have the utility that Saria provides. Saria is a 6 star medic defender with the following talents. Her first is Rhine Charge Suit, which gives Saria stackable attack and defense buffs every 20 seconds after she is deployed, capping out at 5 stacks. At E1, the buff is a flat 2% to both stats, and at E2, it's a 5% attack buff and a 4% defense buff. But Saria's second talent is easily the superior one. Refreshment makes it so that whenever Saria restores an ally's HP, she also restores one SP to them. 
This works wonderfully with all of her skills, making Saria the only 6 star with the first skill worth talking about. At rank 7, First Aid heals an ally by 150% of her attack in a 1 tile radius around her, but only if they have less than 50% of their HP. She can store 2 charges of this skill, and it only needs 5 SP to use. Her second skill, Medicine Dispensing, requires 8 SP, also activates automatically, and heals all allies in the range on screen by 110% of her attack at rank 7. Finally, there's Calcification. This skill requires 80 SP to use, but when you activate it, it does the following. At rank 7, Saria heals all allies in a 3 tile radius around her by 20% of her attack per second, and slows all enemies in this range by 60%, while also increasing the arts damage they take by 40%. At M3, these skills get the following upgrades. First Aid only needs 4 SP, and the heal is buffed to 180% of Saria's attack, and she can now store 3 charges. Medicine Dispensing only needs 7 SP to charge, and it heals up to 140% of her attack. Lastly, Calcification's heal increases to 35%, while increasing the arts damage enemies take by 55%, and now has a 30 second duration compared to the 22 second duration at rank 7. The reason I say Saria is the best operator in the game right now, is not because she hits the hardest, it's not because she heals the most, and it's not because she tanks the best but it is because she can effectively perform all of these roles simultaneously. Saria can hold down lanes, heal allies, and gives allies extra SP while healing them, meaning that Saria's defensive utility also empowers your DPS operators. That third skill isn't used too often right now, but I feel that soon, people are going to need their AS inserters to burn things faster, and that's when it's going to get M3'd a whole lot more. Saria is also great on challenge maps, as her stats are good enough to face tank, she has resistance so she can handle arts damage, and on top of that, her first and second skills have low cooldowns, meaning you can heal sooner and give other operators more SP quicker. Unlike other medic defenders who can only do one or two of these roles well, and the other not so well, Saria is great at tanking, healing, and support. And as if all that wasn't enough, Saria is the only operator in the game worth M9ing right now meaning that you M3 all of her skills because each skill can genuinely be useful depending on the situation. You can argue that Surtur is a better operator, but as this list has shown, there are plenty of operators who can dish out loads of destructive damage and far fewer who can do what Saria does, hence why I think she's deserving of that number one spot. That said, Saria and Surtur just met last month and they're already best friends as they complement each other so well. Anyways, Doctors, that's the end of this video. What do you think of my list? Do you agree with some placements? Disagree with some? Do you think there's an operator I should have mentioned but didn't? Let me know all that good stuff in the comments below. And if you don't really give a damn about all that, share your love for your favorite 6 star operator and tell us why you think they're underrated. I know the banner that's coming up after this has a really interesting operator that I'm kind of curious on, but I don't have the resources to go for considering I don't have Mudrock still. Also, feel free to correct me if I made any mistakes. I know I had a couple in the last video, but I put that blame slightly on Arknight's less than stellar localization, so I wouldn't be surprised if I got something else wrong in this video too. Anyways, any engagement you leave on this channel genuinely helps me. Afford more of those waifu figures because hot damn this game is gonna suck my wallet dry. Hope to see y'all next time, and good luck on your polls, doctors.